At Baptist Health South Florida, it's our mission to care for you when you're injured or sick and help you stay healthy and fit. Welcome to the Baptist Health Talk podcast, where our respected experts bring you timely, practical health and wellness information to improve your family's quality of life. Is your child's sedentary lifestyle of playing video games, watching TV, or being on their phones affecting their waistlines? Well, they're not alone. With the abundance of processed foods and the decreased levels of physical activity, childhood obesity has become a serious health issue. Diagnoses by pediatricians of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, and of course obesity, and also things like painful joint conditions have increased in recent years. For the first time in 15 years, the American Academy of Pediatrics released new guidelines for treating childhood obesity, and the report has some parents starting to realize that taking action now can save their children from a lifetime of health issues. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Fialco. I'm the Chief Population Health Officer for Baptist Health. Here to help us explore this topic is Dr. Anthony Gonzalez. Tony is the Medical Director of Bariatric Surgery at Baptist Health in South Miami Hospital. Welcome to the podcast, Tony. Thank you, John. So, so Tony, this is obviously an important topic in both of our professions, uh, both our specialties, but it's something that that we've been seeing more and more over the last couple of years, if not decades. And I think it's good that it's kind of coming to the forefront in our uh, in our medical professions of recognizing childhood obesity and its consequences. So, so go back towards your experiences and your knowledge uh, and observations. What what do you think are these causes of this increase in child obesity? More children, adolescents um, becoming obese with the attendant problems that are associated with that. What, what what do you think is driving that? Well, obviously, it's something that we've seen grow like you have seen grow. And it's uh, really, really based on too much food, uh, really the accessibility of food and the ease of getting so much food for these youngsters, um, the increased screen time and decreased activity, as opposed to when you and I were young, we were playing in the street and riding bike. And that's not as common as as we see. And then obviously there's uh, obviously other issues like the genes and the hormones that we can't control. But I think the, the accessibility of food and the uh, decreased uh, physical activity and outside activity is really driving this. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with you. I mean, if you, there's probably many factors involved as it is with adult obesity as well, but, but that's when we compare to other generations. Um, uh, and I think you're right, the accessibility of food where whether it's fast foods or, or snacks or kids sitting around playing video games and not just sitting around, but also eating. And then, you know, we used to be out in the streets and riding our bikes till it was dark and going back outside again after it was dark. Do you think some of that is because of, um, you know, working, both parents working or lack of after school activities or uh, the draw of video games or safety where parents don't want their kids out there. Any, any, anything you could think about that, which might have driven that? Not to say it's part of our necessarily our profession. <laughs> right. No, no, I think there are there are multiple factors and really you've mentioned them all. Everything from the food factor where, you know, we have our fast food restaurants and everything is big serving, super sized, um, you know, super big gulps and, and so forth. Um, and uh, large volumes of food that are being served. And then we obviously have the change in um, in the activity level. Uh, now it's more important to be online and be on social media and be in front of the computer or a TV screen and, and the entertainment of you know YouTube and TikTok as opposed to what was entertaining us before, what was out in the street or, or being around the neighborhood uh, in the park, which we're not seeing yeah. as much of. Do you think um, again? I'm gonna I'm gonna harp on a little bit food and exercise since those would be the the biggest drivers. Do you think one is more important to the other? Do you see them related at all? Well, I think they're both related, and I think uh, as we have learned uh, with treating obesity, both of us, and as the American uh, uh, Pediatric Academy has has realized that you know obviously there has to be correct food choices uh, and appropriate right. food choices, and then there has to be more family activity. But we know that it's probably in the upwards of 70, 80, 90 percent of obesity is linked to what you eat. And then anywhere from 10 to 30 percent is based on activity level or exercise. Uh, but it, they go hand in hand because obviously if you're out there doing exercise, you're not eating. And if you're doing sedentary work you're, or sedentary activities and, and on the computer, you're more likely to be munching and, and having the inappropriate uh, food intake. 
Yeah, so clearly it's the quantity of food and then, of course, the processed foods, which has all these substances that are not necessarily natural for human consumption. And then the sugars and the other refined uh, foods, which uh, are very prevalent, but um, obviously it's the quantity. So, um, all right, let's get into a little bit more of um, um, some of the other aspects regarding childhood obesity. Uh, we talk about the term BMI a lot. Um, um, we deal with it, again, in, in, in adult medicine, certainly cardiology and prevention. Can you talk a little bit about the BMI and where some limitations may occur when we just look at what a, a person's BMI? Yeah, the BMI is the body mass index. It's the most crude and the most simple way to measure obesity. Um, and um, it's a patient's weight over their uh, their height over their weight. And um, um, and their weight in kilos over their height in meters squared. And there's a pounds and inches conversion, but the simple, you know, online calculator will help uh, people, uh, you know, calculate their body mass index. We know that appropriate body mass index is 20 to 25. Um, we know that obesity really begins at 30 and health conditions are really affected at a BMI of 30. Uh, we in bariatric surgery, uh, we know that in the treatment for Surgery, it doesn't begin until somebody has a BMI of 35 and has serious medical conditions or BMIs of 40. And a BMI of 40 is 100 pounds overweight. So that our listeners can understand, we're talking about dealing with serious uh, treatments for patients who have 100 pounds of excess weight. Now, in regards to limitations, mm -hmm. it doesn't apply to your bodybuilder who has a large, you know, elevated BMI body mass but is very lean uh, in regard to fat. But for the everyday, you know, American, you and I, and, you know, and most youngsters running around, uh, the body, the BMI is a good indicator of somebody's obesity. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because very often you see BMI reported and the, the, the other the folks will say, well, it's not really accurate. Michael Jordan had a high BMI and we're like, yeah, but you know, you're not Michael Jordan and you're not built like that. We're actually starting in the cardiovascular world to start using waist circumference as another component. So if you have a high BMI and a lot of it's in your waist, obviously that's going to be another indicator uh, from that standpoint. Um, so what are the consequences of obesity? We mentioned a couple of the conditions that pediatricians are seeing. And again, it's children and adolescents. Um, you know, again, what are the consequences of obesity, especially in, um, in, in childhood? Yeah, obviously, this is something that I've seen as we, our adolescent uh, bariatric surgical program has grown at Baptist Health and at South Miami Hospital. I've seen more and more youngsters come with diabetes, uh, with high hmm. blood pressure, with sleep apnea. And not even to talk about the other cycle and social issues that these youngsters are, are having. And you and I know the issues with bullying and, and depression and peer pressure that occurs um, in the school uh, for these youngsters. So, you know, it's, it's a multitude of medical issues that we never saw in young people. Um, and then obviously on top of that, the social and psychological implications uh, of being obese. You know, well said, especially the psychosocial components, which sometimes don't get reported or they're not as uh, overt uh, in, in terms of, you know, when to visit a doctor um, office. And we certainly want the pediatricians and, and they do get engaged with the kid, a, a child's psyche as well, where it could be affected. Um, and the other thing, you know, I, I like your comments because we could say, well, this is, you know, it's a normal part of society, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not because 30 years ago, 50 years ago we were not an obese population and we did not have obese children. So clearly something's changed. It's not just, uh, you know, things that uh, we didn't look for before we, we missed before. So, so again, uh, well said on that. So I do want to get into the bariatric surgical programs. I think it's fascinating. And I do want you to uh, um, bring to our attention some of those updated uh, guidelines, but before we do, what are some of the things, I mean, um, uh, maybe you could speak with if someone comes to see you and says my child or the child says, I mentioned bariatric surgery. You don't say, sure, let's set up surgery tomorrow. So what are the kind of things that both the uh, lay person would look at in terms of helping their child avoid and or correct obesity before it gets to that point and or um, take us through the kind of the, the trajectory before a, patient, a child uh, may get towards uh, consideration of bariatric surgery? Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I think the focus is not to land in bariatric surgery. I think the folks sure. try to catch it early. And I think the advice that I would give parents is uh, you are obviously the biggest role model and you hope to be the best role model for your, for your children. And they're the ones that, you know, really spend a lot of time with you. So if you can model the e correct eating, if you can provide the correct food for those youngsters in your home, uh, that is the first thing you can do. Um, you know, uh, I always ask the adults, 
uh, well, how, why are you eating ice cream? Or did somebody bring it into the house or they deliver it or what, yeah. you know, oh no, we, I buy it. I said, well, of course, I know you go out and buy it. But the youngsters a lot of times don't have ability to go out and do that. And so if the parents are not eating correctly and not setting the correct example, that's the, that's the first problem that we have. Um, the, other, the other thing that the family can do is do things together as a family, uh, as opposed to everybody sitting on the couch or, or everybody just really um, you know, on their phones, go out. Uh, move as a family, uh, go out and do outdoor activities um, and do things on the outside. Everybody should get a bike and go and ride bike together or go take a walk or do a mountain trail. Not that we have mountains in Florida or South Florida, but, <laughs> but I mean, you understand, you know, and, and so I think some of that, the other things that we see is sleep. Um, you know, a lot of these kids are up late at night. They're on the screen, the combination of screen time and lack of sleep. And, and, you know, as, you know, cardiovascular yep. expert and the sleep center that you guys have, and we partner with, you know, very closely in our bariatric surgical program, lack of sleep leads to obesity. And so sleep routine is something that a parent can, can really impose on their children. And if you can decrease screen time, you can increase sleep time. And then obviously, um, you know, you can really try to battle this obesity early on before, you know, your children need bariatric surgery. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up sleep because it speaks to the general, you know, the continuum of the, a, a child's health and their, and their lifestyle. So, like I said, if they go to sleep later, they're up later, they can eat more. There are hormonal changes and, are, and other triggers that can lead to fat deposition and hunger associated with not getting enough sleep. So, these are things that parents may not think about. So, clearly not having unhealthy foods in the house as a priority and having healthier options. You know, we've known, we've talked before, sugar drinks sugar beverages, sodas and juices are prime drivers in, in, in kids for right, like obesity and gaining weight in the concomitant medical conditions. So there's lots of activities that they can do, lots of food changes they can have uh, put in place and then getting a good night's sleep, all, all, all well said. So when uh, a child starts developing obesity and they start visiting pediatrician and they have medical conditions, which unfortunately they may be put on medications to control, ultimately it's because... Uh, um, obesity increases the risk of other chronic diseases. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, obviously that's the concern. We're worried about those uh, those children who are obese will become obese adults if they don't have diabetes and high blood pressure and sleep apnea as adolescents. They'll have it in adulthood, and then obviously we understand the the increased mortality. Uh, with obesity in adulthood. Um, you know, children don't die of obesity uh, with the, uh, obviously, but we're trying to control the obesity at the, at an earlier stage so they don't become a, obese adults um, and have a healthier uh, life as an adult and decrease their, their medical expenditure and their medical care mm. as an adult as well. So, you know, we, uh, the, these youngsters go deal with diabetes and high blood pressure and sleep apnea and into adulthood. All of those conditions will continue, and then they'll see, you know, Dr. Fialco and his colleagues for yeah. artery disease, for cardiovascular <laughs> yes. disease, uh, the obviously the increased risk of cancer and obesity um, and respiratory problems. So that's what we're trying to we're trying to avoid. We're trying to start early, yeah. and you know, the American uh, Pediatric Association has realized that and really given you know some good guidelines in trying to uh, alleviate those problems in adulthood by starting with children. So yeah, again, well said, and it's been shown that obesity in childhood does increase one's risk of an adult of uh, diabetes and, and as well as cancers and cardiovascular. So let's get into those guidelines a little bit. Then we'll touch a little bit on some other therapies that might be out there. Uh, again, recognizing that obviously lifestyle improvement and lifestyle and engaging a healthy lifestyle becomes the, the primary focus for uh, treating and, and, and or avoiding obesity. So how are these guidelines? And, and again, it's first guidelines in over a decade recognizing child obesity as a medical condition. Um, speak a little bit about what the guidelines have said that's unique and how it's been embraced by the medical community. Yeah, so the guidelines are, they're really 13 key points. And John, I'm not going to go through all 13 points. Yeah, of course. But, <laughs> but, but I think, you know, it starts with things like measure the BMI of the child, you know, um, uh, treat the medical conditions, check for hyperlipidemia, yeah. Measure their blood pressure. I mean, check their hemoglobin A1C. So there were some basic things that was surprising to me that maybe the pediatricians are not doing. I mean, I don't remember the pediatricians did them for my kids, you know, uh, when they were young. But but I mean, those are just some of the basic things. Then they went into exhaustive detail uh, about a family unit 
and about using the family and uh, using a multidisciplinary approach to counseling. Um, they went into details about the number of hours that should be spent a week in, you know, counseling the not only the children, but the family in regard to healthy, healthy eating lifestyle, healthy eating habits, and a active lifestyle. And then some of the more, uh, you know, surprising recommendations where their number 12 and 13 were 12, uh, they talked about medication, uh, really should consider, um, you know, if all of the above has failed and, and the child is really becoming the extremes of weight with BMIs in the upwards of 35 to 40, you should consider pharmacotherapy, medications yeah. for weight loss in kids. And then lastly, something we've been doing at Baptist Health for 20 years, and we are a certified adolescent bariatric surgical program, nationally certified, uh, they're now, you know, acknowledging bariatric surgery for the extremes of weights in adolescents as well. And so these have been, you know, the recommendations, some simple and some obviously more extreme. And, and again, the fact that our, our national organizations are recognizing child obesity as a medical condition, one that needs to be addressed, treated uh, and prevented, I think, is in and of itself um, uh, both an indictment in a way of our society because of the lifestyles that are leading to child obesity and, and the other imperatives that are leading to it, as well as fortunate that we're able to at least recognize it and start acting to uh, mitigate the consequences of it. Um, so a couple of final questions, just a little bit more detail. Um, so what are those medications or what are the experiences with the medications? And, you know, uh, are these what's related with the big, you know, both medical benefits and fads? with some of the medications and adults that are out there? What, what are some of the medical treatment options for children with obesity that the guidelines uh, talk about? Yeah, and it, obviously some of them do overlap uh, with what we're seeing in adults. Um, you know, the GLP-1 agonist, people know uh, Ozempic and Saxenda and, um, and Wagovi. And Wagovi particularly um, is one of those GLP-1 agonists. And for our viewers, that's something that's given, you know, originally created for diabetes and it causes a decreased appetite, increases, causes a fullness of the stomach and uh, early satiety and the patient really doesn't want to eat. And those are now recommended and approved for children. Uh, medications um, like uh, Orlistat, which, you know, inhibits fat absorption and other medications like combinations of phenteramine and, um, and medications that are more psychotropic medications like Quismia has also been used in mm -hmm. children. So there are medications that are approved. Uh, beginning even at the age of 12. And there's some medications that are even approved younger than that. Uh, but uh, some of them are uh, unique to the childhood population. And there are medications in adults that we don't use, you know, in kids or not used in kids. Uh, but there is quite a bit of overlap. I, I think two thoughts to those comments. And again, as usual, very articulate and well said. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, of course, we don't want to give children medications where not beneficial. And a lot of folks, and I've had these conversations as well, well, uh, you know, is the medication dangerous? Which, you know, they, they, they are safe and they've been established now for a long time. But there's always a risk. But we know, you know, being 60 pounds overweight and hypertensive and diabetic and, you know, having elevated cholesterol and heart disease is not necessarily safe. So we always have to warrant what's the, what's the, what's the safety of giving the medication? What's the, safe, what's the safety and risk of not giving the medication? The other thing is, I, I think those GLP-1As, uh, GLP-1 and, and, and antagonists are, are, are agonists, I'm sorry, are, are, are really um, um, wonderful because they do decrease hunger. They provide that satiety. And I think a lot of obese people or overweight people and children, they could be 100 pounds overweight and hungry. They could be actually you know, craving. So it's certainly not willpower that makes people overweight or, or a personality defect. And when we recognize those hormonal imbalances, which can lead to people to be hungry and craving even when they're overweight um, is really how these new medications are um, uh, becoming, um, you know, we'll say revolutionary in a way, but although again, we like to not need the medications, but at least we have some options out there. So um, I appreciate that. And then the last thing is uh, take the listeners through just, just uh, you know, what is bariatric surgery? It's a broad term. You know, what are the procedures? What are the outcomes? What's the uh, life changing uh, benefits and potential you know, negatives um, in bariatric surgery as, you know, an absolute, uh, you know, national expert in this area? Yeah. So bariatric surgery is weight loss surgery. It's an operation that we perform on the stomach and or intestines to change somebody's behavior. And as we've mentioned, this is a behavioral problem. It's everything from overeating, wrong food choices, inactivity. And uh, what we do is we can cut the stomach. There's operations like the sleeve gastrectomy, where we cut the stomach and make it thin and tubular like a banana and remove 60 to 70% of the stomach and help the patients uh, with 
early satiety, fullness. It removes a hormone called ghrelin that causes hunger, uh, which helps uh, with weight loss. Um, an operation like that can help somebody lose 60 to 70% of their excess weight. So a youngster who's 100 pounds overweight will lose 60 or 70 pounds uh, with that operation. Other more drastic operations like the gastric bypass, uh, where we cut the stomach, creating a pouch like the size of an egg and connecting the intestines to that pouch is more of a drastic operation and causing more micronutrient deficiencies, more vitamin deficiencies, but it causes better weight loss in the upwards of 75 to 85% of excess body weight loss. So the operations are very successful. They've been successful in children, been successful in adults. Um, initially, we saw great success, even better success in youngsters than we even saw in adults. Nowadays, we're just seeing them, you know, equal. Uh, uh, teens, you know, really perform similar to uh, adults in regard to outcomes. Uh, there's good published data, 15 years of outcomes in, in adolescence, uh, showing that the weight loss is similar, but better resolution of even diabetes and high blood pressure in the youngsters. And something that we know and you've seen that, you know, diabetes has not, not been present present for a long time, it's easier to cure. And so these, these adolescents, their diabetes is, you know, recent onset diabetes. Uh, we can reverse that diabetes early on in adolescence before it gets into adulthood. So, uh, you know, obviously uh, strong surgery, huge benefit. There are risks with like every operation. Um, and uh, as a center of excellence that we are nationally, we try to mitigate that risk. And part of it is long-term follow-up vitamin deficiencies. So we educate the patients preoperatively, we follow them long-term, and we make sure that there are no micronutrient deficiencies long-term uh, with close follow-up. And, and like we said, bariatric surgery is kind of not a last resort, but we do try to help people avoid surgery and get the successes. Um, and that's part of the program as well. You don't go right to surgery, you provide you know, nutritional services, et cetera, et cetera. So, so last question, then I'll, I'll turn it over to you for any final comments is, you know, give us a sense of the gratification you may feel when you had someone who's been, you know, obese for years, fat, fighting obesity, both physical complaints, social, social complaints and adolescent. And then, you know, it's, it, it can be life changing, right? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and since we're talking about kids, I always remember a, a young woman um, who came to me. This is a very common comment that we get from youngsters. And we, we touched upon the social implications. You have these kids that say, you know, they don't, they're not suffering with diabetes and high blood pressure yet, but they like to play basketball with their friends and they don't get picked, you know, or they're, they're short of breath. They can't run up and down the court. And I always remember this young woman who, a young girl who wanted to play sports and she did so good, lost so much weight. She ended up going on to play uh, high school softball, college softball, and we, you know, highlighted her at Baptist Health with one of our stories. And so that brings a lot of gratification because, you know, sometimes it's, yes, curing the diabetes and high blood pressure, but other times it's making people happy and doing what they want to do and what they love to do. So, you know, that is why we do it. That's why we do it. We want to have healthier patients. And then when a patient's healthier, they're going to be happier as well. Fantastic, Tony. Any final comments or anything you want to reiterate or anything we may have missed in the conversation? No, I think we should reiterate just, you know, trying to catch obesity early on. Um, don't wait till your child is 100 pounds of a weight. You know, start with the 10 and 20 pounds, uh, you know, really work as a family unit uh, to have correct and right food choices and then uh, correct activities. Uh, uh, decrease the screen time and, and increase the sleep time. Um, and I think you will avoid seeing, you know, our medical weight loss doctors in, in regard to medications, and you could avoid bariatric mm -hmm. surgery. And so, you know, prevention is the best, you know, type of medicine. So that's what I would recommend. Thanks so much, Tony. We're, we're, de we're ab absolutely fortunate to have you in our Baptist community. Your passion and expertise uh, clearly shine through um, in, in this uh, conversation. Uh, Anthony Gonzalez, Medical Director of Bariatric Surgery at Baptist Health in South Florida. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you, John. To our listeners, if you like what you've heard on this or any of our podcasts, please be sure to tell a friend or a family member about us. And if you have a comment or a suggestion for a future topic, please email us at baptisthealthtalk at baptisthealth.net. That's baptisthealthtalk at baptisthealth.net. We'd love to hear from you. And thanks for listening. Find additional valuable health and wellness information on our resource blog at baptisthealth.net slash news. And be sure to interact with us on our social media channels for live and upcoming events. This podcast is brought to you by Baptist Health South Florida, healthcare that cares.